Uh, I've covered many NDE interviews on this channel, but have you ever wondered if there's a way to see through the veil without having an NDE? Today's guest is here to explain just how he managed to do just that. Welcome to Soul Spy University, where your souls can run free and your minds are free to expand. Today's show is sure to blow your mind and open your world right up. But first, it helps my content to you tremendously. If you could please click that like button, subscribe to be a part of our family so you don't miss out on the news that they're not telling you, and share to help my channel survive. Just a reminder, there is a donation link in the description box. Any little bit helps me to know that someone somewhere is listening. Okay, welcome to the show, Mark Vandergad, a fellow life coach who has also had extremely profound through the veil experiences that he's going to share with us today. Now, I'm going to, is it okay, Mark? I'm, can I just give them a little background on you? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Okay, just a little background, you guys, on Mark. Um, Mark is the premier life transformation coach and life purpose mentor. He's a passionate transformational teacher, dynamic writer, and speaker. As a life purpose expert and devoted teacher of A Course in Miracles for over 30 years, Mark has collaborated with some of the world's most powerful thought leaders and has helped how thousands of people stretch into the grand vision for their lives. Mark is the founder of the Miracle Makers community, which is devoted to providing a place where spiritual seekers and all those searching for more can find a deep connection, true union, and intentional support that make miracles happen. He writes weekly newsletters, Reboot with Mark, and the Forgiveness Practicum. He's also the founder of Radical Reboot Coaching, the Life Shift Summit, and the Shift Event. Mark is now the founder of the Power Cluster Incubator Program, where entrepreneurs, visionaries, and anyone ready to go to the next level come together to launch their grand vision within six months. Damn, Mark. Well, I brought a drink in case you did. I'm sure you're going to need one after all that. Just kidding. I didn't drink either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. I'm happy of to be here. Of course, of course. Um, oh my God. Well, so that's that. And seriously, you make me feel very unaccomplished. Um, I couldn't even decide the simplest decisions today, and you've transformed the world, it seems like, in a week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, there are many days I don't feel very accomplished myself, but, you know, I'm just chugging along, doing what comes to me to do. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, we're going to speak more about that later. And just you guys know, stay till the end so I can tell you exactly where to find Mark. But first, Mark, you didn't just you weren't just born this way, although you were. But I know you've had a lot of profound experiences that you feel are near dear near death, meaning you've had like that seeing through the veil moment and uh, really cut through moments without, thank God, having an actual NDE where you're clinically dead, but you were maybe about to be, right? Exactly. Yeah. Many of those. Uh, I call them near, near death experiences because my body didn't die. But um, I, so I think what happens when you are, first of all, many people have asked me, why do you get to have so many miracles? And what I say is, I'm just a dumb guy. I'm not special. I've just done a lot of dumb things in my life. I took a lot of risks. And I wouldn't recommend having mystical experiences the way I've had them. I don't recommend it. There are other better, much better ways to have them, which I've learned over time. But anyway, so um, I think when you're near, near death, <laughs> when you're near death, but haven't died, when that moment is there, um, and there's basically an option. I'm either staying in this body or I'm going because uh, my understanding is that you, all death is really suicide. You know, you don't, nobody leaves here without their agreement on some level. And so you have that moment when you're doing something dangerous, like the types of things I would do, and you're about to, to kick the bucket. At that moment, you know, we call it like there's the lifting of the veil. 
or you know the portal opens but what how i would actually say and how i would really describe it is heaven dips down into this earth plane reality just imagine like a a big chunk of heaven just dipping down and it, it engulfs you and it's like the, the 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 other dimension the other side is dipping down into this dimension and you're then while in this dimension you're surrounded by the other dimension and everything that's in that dimension in heaven is available to you and so you me when i've had these multiple experiences of this the the uh, environment seems to be the same but nobody's in that dimension with me or not many people are in there with me so others may not be seeing what i'm seeing or experiencing what i'm experiencing it's very specific to those that are in need in that moment and so it's a really interesting thing that happens um, i first realized what exactly was happening when a very close friend of mine i called him daddy don he was you know significantly older than me he worked with me when I worked in an organization, he was a volunteer for me, but he was older than me. And I just loved this guy. My dad passed away a long time ago. So I asked him if he would, you know, step in and be my dad, my surrogate dad. And he said, yeah. So I called him Daddy Don. Well, he, long story short, he was sick. He was passing away. Um, he knew my story about my father and that I wasn't there when he passed and how painful that was for me. He literally hung on in a bed in his living room until his children, because he was in a coma, were smart enough, realized, why is he hanging on? He's hanging on for me, his adopted son. And so they called me. I jumped a train from Chicago to Detroit, and I walked in the room at like midnight. They all went to bed. All his children were very awesome people, nice people, but they've been up for days with him. So they all went to bed. My close friend, Julia, who was one of the siblings, that's how I met Don, went to bed as well. And it was just me and Don. I was sitting next to his bed, you know, like a hospital bed in his living room and, and perfect. It was a perfect scene because he loved sports and we had the baseball game playing in the background. And, and I just sat next to him in this calm. And it was like, all of a sudden was like this tingly, I can't explain it by tingly feeling the environment was changing. It was like heaven dipped down into the room. I could feel, I couldn't see them, but I knew they were there. Was I have had times of seeing angels, but in this experience, it was just like a knowing that they were sort of perched up above waiting for him to agree to go. And that up to that point, he wasn't in agreement. But And so we were, he, what started to happen was he and I started to have this conversation in our minds. So heaven is sort of like if you had a pool of water, I call it its absolute conductivity. So if you had a pool of water and you put a cable, an electric cable on one end, it was live, and you put a cable on the other end, the, the electricity would go through that water right into the other cable, right? That's sort of what heaven is. So you're, it's, you know, you could communicate without having to speak. Your minds are completely, totally connected in that environment. And so he and I were communicating, saying our goodbyes, acknowledging how much we loved each other, all that stuff, and then just being together. It felt like a long time, but it was literally about 15 minutes. About 15 minutes after I walked in that door, he was ready. In that moment, his daughter came running out of a room. She knew. she. We were like a, a trio. We would hang out together a lot. And she knelt down at his side, and I said, he's he's getting ready to pass. And then, actually, he was, once his daughter came out, he was a little resistant yet. Like, he didn't want to leave her. And and I was sort of like, Don, you got to go. It's time. You know, if you don't go now, you're causing more pain. And we were having this conversation. He was sort of chuckling. And then these angels swooped down. He stepped into their, sort of their arms, into their energy. And he was lifted out of his body. Oh, That's how I... That's how I understand what's actually happening in those experiences. It's like a dipping down. That's how I would describe it. And that was what happened in these other experiences that I, I may tell you about. Yep. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Now, did you see in this experience, did you see the angels come down or? Um, as you know, so seeing, so I would say yes, but not in a way you would understand. 
Mm -hmm. It's like I'm seeing it in my mind. It's yeah. they're they're energetic. Mm -hmm. I'm in there with them. I know they're there, but it wasn't like you would see with your visual sight. Do I've had those experiences too? Mm -hmm. but that wasn't what was happening here, but they were there. They knew I knew. I knew, you know, it was like in a way I was seeing them. So yeah, but they weren't a physical shape. They were just these angelic beings. They were more like light energy. And they were all at once like separate balls of light, but also everything connected. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a, a beautiful experience. I'm so grateful to have had it. Um, and you know, being able to share that story with his family helped everybody, right? It's just oh, God, yeah. an, an understanding. Yeah. So yeah. Oh my God, that that is amazing. And just to clarify for YouTube standards, because I know what you mean, Mark, and I'm sure my audience knows what you mean. But when he says the S word, meaning offing yourself, which we're not, we're not really supposed to say on YouTube, what he's what he's referring to, oh. I believe, is that, and I, I know this from various near-death experiences, sirs, that there's like points in your life where you could, it's like a exit point. Um, right. But, you know, what we encourage on this channel is to stay here for as long as you possibly can, because apparently we've been waiting to come to this Vegas of, a, right. of, a, of a world. Um, and uh, once you get to the other side, you'll know why, because really we're here for only a second, um, no matter how much it feels like forever when we're going through our earthly stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, like that's that's just so amazing. And and what we're going to get into more here is, look, he had that experience and he didn't have to almost, um, you know, he wasn't on the edge of his life for it. So that's amazing. And we're going to get into more of that because, guys, I want you to understand that you can have magical, mystical experiences, especially now that we're all awakening as a collective. Um, don't think you have to put yourself in danger for it, please. <laughs> Absolutely not. Right. And I'm sorry for using that word. I wasn't. It's not how I see that word. It's just a choice. You you can't leave here without your choice on some level. Yes. And, so, and, and also the way I understand it from these different experiences and um, different times when I've received information is you're, there is a d divine plan and everybody's a part of the plan and you have your specific part in the plan. You can choose to you know, fulfill that role in this lifetime or another, you will eventually choose to fulfill it. Um, but, you know, and with that part is definitely an exit point. It's by design. Um, and it's a choice. You can stay longer, you can leave earlier. Um, I absolutely recommend staying as long as you can. There's so much good you can do, right? And so, yeah, so just knowing that there is a choice and why not choose to stay? That's the idea. I mean, yeah. we all have many reasons not to choose to stay, uh, but it's good to know and believe in the unseen that you chose to be here, guys, and it's really for a very specific reason. And trust me, Mark, if you and I were talking, I would know exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah. You're just having to abide in the YouTube world for now. But yeah. uh, back to the real world, which is the angelic world, can you tell me more about when you um, saw angels? Um, well, so there are a lot of times where I've had those experiences. The one that I will share in this moment, I might share one other brief story. Um, so probably one of the earlier experiences, I was a young guy, you know, 20, maybe, I don't know, somewhere around there and had been with my buddy and my, and my brother we went to North Carolina and my buddy lived there. And long story short, we came up with this brilliant idea to go body surfing, to drive the four hours from where he lived to the North Carolina shore coast um, with my buddy's girlfriend and my brother and my buddy. And um, what that morning when we got up to do that, it was storming out and it turned out it was a what they call New Jersey, where I'm from, a nor'easter or northeaster, right, which is a pretty significant storm, which <laughs> typically comes with very big swells in the ocean, which we wanted. We wanted those swells, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, we decided to drive there anyway. Of course, the only woman amongst us was like, "Don't do this. <laughs> it's not a good idea." But we were, you know, just being guys. We were list weren't listening. We went got in the water. We we're having a great time. I mean, it was a lot of fun. 
and the waves were amazing. They're like 15 to 20 foot swells. It was crazy. And we were able to go out really far. And we didn't know it at the time. We were standing on a sandbar. You know, the tides could create these sandbars. And so we were really far out riding these long waves, having a great time until we weren't. Until oh, no. <laughs> it was like, it was so sudden. I, I can't even describe to you what it was like. But all of a sudden, it went from waves rolling in towards the beach to crashing all around me and I was struggling to keep my head above water. I couldn't touch ground, couldn't touch the bottom. What had happened was we got caught in a riptide, which I didn't even know what that was at the time. So the same currents that create that sandbar became what pulled us off the sandbar in, in this riptide. And then I just was frantically searching around to see if I could find my brother and my buddy, Ronnie. I, I couldn't see anybody the way I'm literally, I was, inhaling water i was it was a struggle and one moment i was sort of lifted up by this swell and i could see my brother and my buddy were way further out in the ocean than me they got pulled way out oh no i realized i'm alone and i'm kind of screwed here because i'm not you know even though we grew up near the beach in new jersey i'm not the best swimmer mm -hmm. um we didn't surf with boards we did body surfing mm -hmm. and i was struggling at this point i was like struggling to keep my head above water and this thing happens when you're about to die <laughs> i can't quite explain but when i looked at my brother he was far away but man we locked eyes and i could see him he was even even more panicked than me and he was conveying information to me and he was saying i need your help i need you to come get me and I was like, dude, I'd love to come get you, but I'm, I have, I don't have it in me. I'm, I'm drowning myself. If I come out there, we're both going to die. But right. I was trying to and let him know I'm going to get help. And that was my, I was just paddling as hard as I could, but it kept ripping me out further. Oh and so God. a moment comes when you're so exhausted and you're so close to dying. It's like this moment where you're like, you start to want to relax. And so I started to relax and let myself go underwater to try to catch my energy a little bit, or relax and, you know, conserve on energy. But what started to happen was I was relaxing more and more. And I, without realizing, I was becoming more and more comfortable under the water than above the water. And at some point, I just, something in me said, it's okay to give up the fight. And you just sort of want to give in to whatever it is that's waiting for you on the other side. It's like, this is easier than trying to fight. And I can't explain what causes that. I've had it before. And you just start, I'm no longer afraid. And I just started to let go. And I was sinking down very rapidly. And into like, it was cold down there. But in a way, it felt like I was sinking into a warm place. It was like falling asleep after a long, hard day. And I was starting to just sort of go out and, and let go. And all of a sudden, I had this flash like lightning in my mind. I was in the liver, in the kitchen with my mother in the future with her finding out. She gets a phone call that her two sons died, drowned off the coast of North Carolina. And I'm like inside her when this is, I can feel her getting this information and the pain she felt was so severe, the collapse inside of her. I was so overwhelming. It shocked me like awake. And I shot up to the surface and I begging God out loud, like, please help me oh because God. I can't let her go through that. <laughs> that was that it wasn't about saving myself, it was about saving my mom from that experience. And and then I'm started paddling really hard. All of a sudden my feet are paddling and I felt my foot hit something. And so I thrusted my leg towards it and I dug in. It was the edge of the sandbar. And so I was able to pull myself up onto the sandbar. It was about chest high in the water again. And I just started, you know, forcing myself in with my legs. It, it was miraculous that that happened. You know, I know time and space shifts. You know, when heaven dips down, it's not the laws of the world. Um, the laws of heaven supersede the laws of the world. Right. So it's not at the mercy of time and space. And I believe I was placed there, removed and placed to where I can get. And so as I'm pushing myself into dry land, I have this. Now, remember, it's a northeaster. So it's raining and it's windy. 
and it's like dark gray clouds. It's not any moment that anybody would want to be out on the beach, except these crazy kids, right? I see an old man on the beach. He looked like a fat old Italian guy wearing a fisherman's cap with just bathing trunks on. And, and he's got a stogie, a cigar in his mouth, and he's pacing up and down the beach. Like he's, as if he's like, you know, just in deep thought in the sunshine. And I'm, I, in the moment, you know, you sort of know this is a weird thing to see, but er, so much is going on and the trauma of everything. You don't really pay attention to that. And so I run, I get out of the war and I run up to him. I'm literally crying. I look back and I see my brother. He's still completely fixed on me, but now he's like a speck. I can barely see him. Oh. And, and my buddy Ronnie is nowhere to be seen. His girlfriend is nowhere to be seen. She was on the beach watching us, but none of those people are there. There's this guy pacing the beach, pulls out the cigar. I run up to him and I put my hands on his shoulder and I'm crying and begging him out loud. I'm like, Mr. Mr. Can you please help us? My brother is drowning. Uh -huh. And he takes the cigar out. He points it into my at, towards me, towards my face. He goes, he sort of winks at me. He goes, don't worry, son. Help is on its way. Oh, thank God. Oh, my God. And I said, you know what? It actually made me angry because I couldn't yeah. imagine yeah. where that help was coming from. It obviously <laughs> wasn't going to be him. And I'm like, you, I said, you don't understand. He's drowning. And I just ran from him yeah. and started frantically running down the beach trying to find some way to save him. Okay. Yeah. This is so crazy. All right. The next thing I see, by the way, when I was near him, it was like, this is weird. Again, I didn't really focus on it at the time, but it was like very calm around him. It wasn't raining around him. Hmm. It was this weird, calm thing. And he was very calm. Don't worry, son. You know, like, what the heck? Around the so guy? There, yeah. It was raining around your brother or the guy? The guy. Oh, my. Yeah. The old Italian guy. By the way, when he first was reacting to you calmly, I was getting freaked out as well i was about to be like this is an emergency you know what i mean but it's so funny what he said what he said but go ahead yeah it's like it because none of it makes sense none of this makes sense and you're i'm already in this like freaked out place and so my mind is just like save your brother yeah and so yeah. i'm running down the beach now and i am in the rain now it's windy and, and i see another old guy in his trunks laying on a raft one of those clear like rafts people take to the beach you know you float around on it and it was again a very strange sight like why would he be laying in the rat in the rain on his raft it's like he's sunbathing i ran up to him i didn't even ask this time i did say i need that and yeah. i grabbed the raft and i ripped it out from under him and he sort of pancaked and i never looked back at him i just ran straight to the water now this is the part of the story where i feel bad to this day because this thing happens in your physical body Let's when see. you just yeah you've just been in danger your this thing was about to kill you which is the ocean mm -hmm. and now my mind is like get in there swim out to your brother get in the raft but my body is like oh hesitating getting in that water yeah. and so i'm pushing against my own physical resistance and i'm like oh god please help me help me i gotta get out to him all of a sudden, I'm about knee high in the water. I've got this raft in my hand. I see my brother like he's barely keeping his head above water. And I hear these this running, these footsteps. There was a big dune on the beach between the beach and what was hotels in the background. You couldn't see because of this dune. I see this guy like a movie, like slow motion. He's running over this dune. And he's like, you know, my age. He's a young guy not one of those old guys. And he's got this long flowing sort of dirty blonde hair. And he's like a tall, lean guy in these surfer trunks. And he comes running, he goes, I, and with the kindest look on his face, he just runs right to me. He goes, I got that. And he, and I hand him the raft. He takes the raft. And you know what? This was my experience. Take what you like, leave the rest. But what I experienced was he had the end of the raft and so he pointed it out in front of him lengthwise. He was yeah. holding lengthwise. And I'm watching this. And then I see what looks like space telescoping. So my brother was like, he had to be 100 yards or more out. 
he was like a speck. All of a sudden, he can't. It's just like the space between him and the raft collapsed. My brother grabs the raft. Oh my the God. guy pulls the raft to me and hands me the other end. And of course, I'm just so excited that my brother's alive. We let go of the raft. We're hugging. My brother's like, what took you so long? <laughs> I'm like, dude, I was doing the best that I could. I was trying to find help. He goes, why were you moving so slow towards the water? I'm like, I'm sorry. And so, and then I'll, he, I'm crying. He's crying. And and then we stop it. He goes, okay, okay, where's where's that guy? Because we wanted to thank him. Yeah. We turned to the beach. Both of the older guys were not there. The raft was not there. And the young guy was not there. And this is a matter of, what, 30 seconds. And who was there was my buddy Ronnie and his girlfriend at the time. And they, she was crying. She was very upset with what happened. And then we went up to them and everyone was hugging. We are like, let's just get out of here. Now, that's the experience. I know those are angels. I know that's what happened. And let me just to make a little icing on the cake here. Years later, I don't remember... But it was multiple years later. I won't go into the whole experience, but I was in a experience with somebody who was sort of, what do you call it? Uh, regressing me, doing past life regression. Yeah. And um, now I didn't see it, but what she saw, she said there, you know, sometimes angels come to help you with the regression. They'll bring you to where, you know, what you need to remember. And I had a, a really cool experience. I'm not going to get into all that. But what she said to me was, oh, you have a um, a guide, a spirit guide. They're, they're sort of like angels. This is how she described it to me. But they were once alive. And now they've, they've gone past physical life and they've had enough lives. So they're, they're here. They remain with us to guide us. Um, and But they're in spirit form. And she said, you have a spirit guide. He's a really funny guy. He's a little short, fat Italian guy, and he smokes cigars. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's who that was. And I told her that. I was like, oh, my gosh. And then I told her the experience. She said, yeah, absolutely. He's acknowledging that's that's who it was. Now, you know, could she have been making that stuff up? Sure. But I, my gut said, no, there's no way she came up with that, you know, making stuff up. Like, how do you come up with that? And so I know for sure. That was a spirit guide or an angel. You can call them angels. Um, and that others were sent to help. Oh, my God. That was riveting. Yeah. Dude, you know what? There's been many. Again, I've told you I was we were, you know, crazy young guys from South Jersey. I had, a, you know, a rough childhood. We were just trying to escape you know, our life and do all these crazy things. That's really what was going on. And we got into a lot of really dangerous situations and in, in every single one, we were saved and everyone, I can tell you multiple stories like that, you know, angels, people that used to be in a body, no longer. It's like what, a, what I believe allows it to occur is there are several things that are really important. One is you have to acknowledge that you don't have the power to fix this thing. This is how miracles occur. You have to acknowledge, I can't do it. And this, these are the components that were, when I reviewed it over time, that were always there in those situations. I relinquished my will and I, in, and I knew something was there to help me. Because of my spiritual practice and all my experiences with that, I am 100% faithful. Like you gain your faith by practice and the, the results of your practice. So I know that there's help there for me and I knew to turn to it. And so then I turn to it and you have to ask, always seek knowledge, always seek that help. You have to invite them in because without that invite, they can't intercede on your behalf. They have to wait to be invited, right? And so you have to know they're there. You have to relinquish your will and you have to ask. You have to invite them in. And also one component, and I'm not saying this has to be there, but for me it was always there, is that it's more than just about saving my ass or saving me. I'm sorry about the language. I curse a little bit. So I, more about just saving me. It, it, my intention, it was actually more about others than myself in that moment. Yeah. Not that you know, I wasn't wanting to save mine, but you get to that point where you no longer care that I tried to describe earlier. But then what surfaces is, is, no, I have a purpose here. And my purpose is to help others, save others. 
that's all of our purpose, the shared purpose that we have. And that kicks in. And so that need to stick around and save, I think that allows what we say the veil to open, right? Or the portal to open. But really what I think is heaven dips down into your space and then all manner of miracles are available to you. And there's nothing that cannot be done or cured or healed or repaired or managed in, in the space of heaven, right? It's, it's completely you know, omnipotent, omniscient, you know, um, and, you know, omnipresent. It's, it's there always all the time, right? All powerful. Oh my God. I love that. So it's so interesting because two points um, I've had, I've had, okay. I've had actual near earth experiences, but I've also had them um, in my dreams. Right. Um, and in the dreams, it was very like real. You ever have those vivid dreams, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And when, when we're all like, I was trying to protect like the people that raised me that were like full Italian or whatever. And they, um, so I had them all in my like last apartment and it was like big tsunami outside and apocalyptic or whatever. And I've had a few dreams like this that vary in the situation, but basically when they turn to me, which is so interesting because in life, they just think I'm a silly little rabbit. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, you know, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but in the dream, what happened was everybody was actually scared for their lives. So all of a sudden they turned to me, which was weird. Um, but it was so natural in the dream. And finally, I, I was like, okay, it's okay. And I turned within and went up. And whenever I turn within and go up in a dream where we're all about to die or I'm about to die or something, I feel like Jesus wakes me up, you know, it's been a lot like that. Yeah. That's really, I think that's a great analogy for life because, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher of a course of miracles and a course of miracles basically says in truth, this is all a dream. It's not your ultimate reality. And that that's what's happening because a dream can be augmented. A lot can happen in a dream that's beyond what you think is possible. And so when that comes in, I always tell this funny story. It's sort of a joke, but it's like, okay, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I have my relationship with, you know, Jesus, God is just very human. And so I think, you know, you can't hurt God. And so I just talk to him like a buddy, right? But it's like, God is up there and there's like this well, and he can look down in the well. He's following your life. Everybody's got a well to their life. And God's looking down the well at Mark. He's saying, Jesus, Jesus, come here. Come here. Look at this guy. Here he goes again. You need to get your angels together and send them down there. It's like, he's like, can you believe this guy? You know, it's like, here he goes again. And that's sort of, I think, been my life. I don't think you have to, you know, um, disregard your life like I have in the past. Put yourself in dangerous situations. I know you don't have to because I've had those experiences without doing that now. Yeah. These, those components that I described have to sort of be there. You Not sort of, but they have to be there. You have to relinquish your will. You have to ask. Those are so important. You have to trust there's something there that is there to help you and there's nothing it can't do. Yep. You have to invite it in, right? And it has to be about more than just, uh, please put money in my bank account. It doesn't work like that, right? Yeah. It has to be about, you know, you and those around you in the world, mm -hmm. like you want to lift it up. And if you, you practice those, you practice that on a regular basis. You know, A Course of Miracles talks about forgiveness, but mm -hmm. it defines forgiveness very differently than most other teachings. It's not a pardon, according to the Course of Miracles. Uh, the type of forgiveness the course is talking about, if you practice pardoning people, you're actually creating more separation. Mm -hmm. It's not that because you're saying I'm better than you. I'm going to let you slide or whatever. It's yeah. not that kind of forgiveness. The course calls that forgiveness to destroy. And it's destroying your connection with people. The type of forgiveness the course talks about is the willingness. What forgiveness actually means is the willingness to see the truth. Or another way to say that is the willingness to allow you know, God's vision, Holy Spirit's vision of who and what's in front of you to supersede yours. Allow yeah. yourself to be shown, you know, the truth in this person or this being when you ask for that. And you can do that on the regular. And that is what I recommend. Any situation that's disturbing to you in any way, according to the course, is because you are seeing something that isn't ultimately true. It's a misinterpretation or misunderstanding or an illusion. 
It's a yeah. misunderstanding of who and what you are, who and what everyone else is, and who and what God is. And if you ask to see the truth, that truth will enter in and it will take over. It'll take charge, but you, you have to invite that in. You practice that enough in all the little places in your life. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have the traumatic events. Mm -hmm. You practice it enough. You sort of walk around in a posture of forgiveness. So mm -hmm. then it's no longer necessary to overtly or out loud ask. Mm -hmm. You're in a posture of asking, and that's when you're sort of living a miraculous life. Miracles are just flowing in because it's an agreement now. I've I'm it's my life is yours. Bring to me whatever's for my highest good, whatever will help me achieve my purpose in this world. And you know, you're in this sort of constant space of relinquishment. That's a powerful place. You get there by practice. And at first you're there little bits of time. You know, you sort of like oscillate back and forth, and then you take your will back. And but over time you spend more and more time in that place of I don't know. I relinquish. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what happened in those dreams. When I, I use the metaphor, go in and go up, because that's what it looks like to me. But I was really just going, I was connecting to God and, and just going like, all right, we're exiting this dream for a second. Like, I trust you, you know, and um, it's so funny how it is, because even like um, last week, I didn't know I was going to ask you to do this interview. Like I was in your class and um, the one time I'm dazing out in your class, I'm like, oh, I have to podcast next week. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I have an opening before like seven podcasts. And it was like, who should I ask? And then I look up and I see you talking and I'm like, yeah, okay. And then, <laughs> and then of course it's like, when you're doing what, what it's called to you, I didn't go to that meeting knowing I was going to do that, you know, but it's riveting when you're doing what it's called to you, but it's also, I find a funny joke with with god jesus and the angels because i do it and you said yes and i was like awesome i guess it's meant to be and i'm all excited but of course i go to my partner i'm like guess what i just signed up for you know because um love you and this is honestly the best interview i've ever done but oh. uh, i'm having so much fun and uh but it's so funny because as a woman i was just waking up to youtube last night teaching me there are certain biological times women literally need to rest and i just feel like jesus is like that's hilarious that's hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I mean, at this level, there are rules like that and laws and things that apply, but you don't have, I don't have to be, and you don't have to be limited by that. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we are much more than that. And with that invite, you're expanding. This is the thing. I, people, it's very uncomfortable to expand into your grandeur. Mm -hmm. We are, we are much more comfortable in this tiny little, what we think is us, this little bag of bones and water and this little life, no matter how big your life is, relative to what you really are, who and what you are, it's little. And so expanding can be very uncomfortable. It's sort of like most people are like, you know, the, the caterpillar crawls into the cocoon, right? And it starts to become a butterfly in the cocoon. It's nice and warm in there. And in order for that to happen, most people probably know this, but there are starter cells in the inside the caterpillar that are butterfly cells. They have all the genetics to make a butterfly when once the caterpillar has stuffed its face enough its body starts to break down all the cells start to burst open those cells become the material for the other cells to grow in and become this butterfly when that starts happening inside the cocoon it gets very uncomfortable because these wings are growing a complete metamorphosis this thing is transforming it's getting very big and it's very tight in that little cocoon it sounds it, like me once a month, Mark. I'm yeah, right. Kidding. Right. And so you want to stay in. You don't. It's like it's uncomfortable, but it gets to a point where it's more uncomfortable to stay small than to let yourself out. And here's another thing. If you, if somebody tries to fix me, sees me in this discomfort and tries, you know, to make things comfortable for me, that's not the nicest thing to do for me. You may think it is, but if you go in and slit that cocoon open and let that butterfly out, it will die. It will never its wings will never expand. It will never be able to fly. It'll die right there on the vine because that act of, of having to open its own cocoon, squeeze itself out that little crack, pushes all the fluid into the wings and opens the wings. The same is true for us, but none of that is comfortable. We'd much rather just go along about our business and you know not expand. So expanding isn't comfortable. 
but I highly recommend it because in your expansion is your is your um, success in your purpose in life, which I'd like to talk a little about if we have any time. Oh, but, of course. Yeah. Right. It's so interesting. Also, you mentioned about, I'm just going to hang on one second. Uh, I don't know why I did it. Thank you. <laughs> no, you're good. You're, um, so it's interesting because what I also realized uh, to your points about all these magical experiences is when push comes to shove in life, like what happened to you with the waves or where you're near, near death or something like that, you have these moments where you really, I noticed from what you said about to others or whatever, that you really do see through the veil in terms of for others. So like even this morning when I was trying to meditate, what came up is a few traumatic experiences I had. And all I thought about during those traumatic experiences wasn't me, but a younger friend of mine that witnessed it. I felt so bad for her during that. Yeah. Like when I went through that, like I'm bleeding and I'm like, oh God, she had to witness that, you know, or like once I got hit by a car and um, the, the secretary of the, so, I lived in Newtown, Connecticut for like a year and a half. And like my aunt was the vice principal of it. And uh, basically the last day of seventh grade, uh, I was very, I got attached to the, the secretary. So I was only there a semester and I was, you know, me and the secretary were like good. And um, I was walking to the orthodontist and I got hit by a car trying to cross the street. And you got it. She knew. Like she ran down the block when she heard sirens and um, cause nothing ever happens in that town. And if it does, it makes headlines, you know? Yeah. Like prior to that, like the neighbor put his family through a wood chipper. Like it's very bizarre and everybody knows the third thing that happened. I was the second thing. So, so she knew, but what I woke up to is as I'm in the stretcher, she's over me. Like as I'm going into the, like the thing and I just saw in her eyes like you know how you saw in your brother's eyes the emotion I I all I saw even though I was near death like I woke up for a second and I was like I'm so sorry because I saw people coming towards me I'm, like, I'm so sorry and then and then I woke up again and she was over me and I saw the love concern I knew it was legit concern because so in but instead of caring like oh I might die like it was just like all I saw was wow she's so loving you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so in these, these experiences, it's like, like there was a few times I almost died and my whole thing was uh, on others experiences, the same way you saw your mother, the same way you saw your brother, you know? Um, so I just think that's, that's so interesting um, because I feel like that is through the veil is, and that's what the course of miracles teaches, right? Is that everything's really love. And if not, it's not real. Like only love is real. That's right. And speaking, exactly. of, yeah, and speaking of which, you knew Marianne Williamson, right? Yep. I worked with Marianne. Uh, I went to Egypt with Marianne on a spiritual pilgrimage. That's how I got to know her, just through a series of events. We sort of connected on that trip. Um, and then over time, she had invited me to come to Detroit, where she was working at a uh, as a spiritual leader of the, the largest unity church at the time was there just outside of Detroit. And so I eventually sold my business and went to work with her in the global Renaissance Alliance. And um, I became the, the uh, we had these things called peace circles, teaching people how to join together in under one purpose and, you know, manifest miracles basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the peace circle uh, facilitator and trainer Um the global peace circle trainer is, was my title. And I, you know, I had to grow into that title, trust me, but it transformed my life to work with her and do that work. Um, and eventually I went off on my own and started doing my own work, but I, you know, gleaning a lot of uh, what I do from working with Marianne and the course of miracles. And, um, you know, also Debbie Ford, I worked with Debbie Ford. She was, she's the one who taught me um, the type of coaching that I do. She passed away a few years ago. She wrote, wrote the book, um, Dark Side of the Light Chasers. Some of your audience might know that book. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend Mary Ann's books. Um, you know, A Return to Love, amazing book. But yeah, I've been around. I'm like Forrest Gump. <laughs> you know, I've been around a lot of very powerful, potent spiritual teachers, amazing people. And, um, you know, I, each one has lifted me up. I spent a week in the desert with Don Miguel Ruiz, you know, um, doing a, a Toltec uh, shaman training 
Um, and then if anybody's the real deal, oh my gosh, that guy, you know, he's definitely either enlightened or very close. Um, so yeah, yeah, a lot of my work, it pulls, you know, I'm eclectic. I pull from all that stuff. But in truth, they're all teaching the same thing, just a slightly different form of it, right? Yeah, yeah. How amazing. And um, it's so interesting because I, I did a lot of videos on the butterfly analogy that you did, right? Because it comes during. And then um, Christine, our friend, also told me told me the butterfly analogy. And, you know, she gets divine information. Now, after I asked if you could do the interview last week, um, I was having lunch and three doves came to my window. Huh. Three doves. And um, they stayed for a while until I finally looked up the meaning of why there's three doves in my window. And I basically, as, as angels do, right? They answer like everything I've been wondering about. So a multitude of things at once, you know, cause they're very synchronistic like that. And um, interestingly enough, I never had a fear of death, right? But the last answer that I noticed that the meaning of doves answered this exact fear I had that started a week prior which was weird because I've never scared of death. And then somebody told me ghosts were like trapped souls that um, that like can't find their way to the other side or something. And I was like, oh, great. Like, I'm like, you know, I can't even find my way to the store half the time. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I thought the one thing we all can't do wrong as humans, unless it's on purpose is die. You know, that's the one thing we can get right. Like, you know, angel, whatever, like, will come or whatever, right? And I'm like, so if there's a chance to get it wrong, I will find it. And I am now freaking out and I'm worry birding all week. And the last message I saw that does represent is that they come and usher you to the other side in some cultures. So basically that among other things, they're like, chill, we got you, you know, like chill. Like that's how I feel angels were saying. I also had this weird feeling, even though I just met Christine, our friend the day before, I got to tell her, I, I sent her the pictures, the videos of these doves. And she was like, oh my God, I just saw a psychic a month ago who told me I was gonna see doves. So you're a messenger, right? So it's so cool like that. How That like, is cool. And that's exactly how it works. I mean, according to the Course of Miracles, you're no miracles for just one person or just you. A true miracle will be that thing that happens to heal you or save you or whatever, but also will affect everyone you know and everyone they know and everyone they know ad infinitum throughout eternity like there's no way i can know what that would be but of course you know the holy spirit knows what that is that's the miracle so yes it's going to touch your life but then when you share that story it touched her life and it all fits perfectly like all these puzzle pieces coming together it's by design none of that is an accident and my you know a lot of people get fearful around angels and excuse me, psychic experiences. I think, you know, a lot of, let's just say, teachings out there have fostered fear in us, right? And that's about control. Um, but the God I know and the God that I've experienced and the Holy Spirit that I've experienced, and, you know, you don't have to have a relationship with Jesus, by the way, to have this stuff happen. If Jesus is your way, then go for it. And Jesus is my way, right? Yeah. And so I was raised Catholic, I was a, you know, uh, I got a lot of trouble in Catholic school, especially in catechism, teaching religion, because there were things they would say, and I'd be like, nah, I don't buy that. I don't think that's true. Right. That's, this, this is more like what Jesus is like, right? So I have this like connection. And if you invite that in, you are just completely safe. Like there's nothing, first of all, the Course says all that evil is or darkness or anything like that is a lack of something it's it's an absence of love but which can't really be absent it's it's an absence of your awareness of love of true love so when things are coming to you to help you angels or whatever there's no way they could do harm if you're interpreting you can interpret something because you're afraid it's like the course says if you if you go to wake up a little kid who's in the middle of a nightmare at first the light that starts coming into his eyes are going to enter the nightmare and scare him mm -hmm. or her right so so it recommends you don't do that which is how spirit works holy spirit jesus god they they never do anything to shock you awake it's a slow gradual gentle process all of what you need is sent to you and mm -hmm. as you ask for more and more is sent 
right? And so it's our interpretation that makes angels look like demons to us. They're never demons. What's coming is always the light. Mm -hmm. Anything that's not the light doesn't exist. It's nothing. It can't affect you or do harm. Mm -hmm. What does harm is our own mind, our own thinking, and our interpretation of a thing. And if you look at your relationships, you're going to see how this is working at this level. What's really harming you about your boyfriend or your girlfriend's decision to do whatever they're not harming you it's your what you're making that mean right mm -hmm. and the same is true when it comes to angels there's all manner of help and support for you and it will come to you in the exact right way that you will understand it if you invite it it mm -hmm. will never do harm that's that's one way to keep yourself safe keep inviting mm -hmm. spirit come to me i used to suffer with very significant um, anxiety disorder mm -hmm. in my young, in my early twenties, when I was younger, I just started to have these panic attacks. Now they turned out on a biological level was blood sugar issues, but because they caused panic, it then became psychological. I then started to become afraid of becoming afraid. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to become its own self-fulfilling prophecy. I didn't know mm -hmm. at that time, nobody knew how to help me. I was misdiagnosed all over the place, which only added to my panic. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I did what I knew to do what I learned to do you know when I was a little boy which was go to Jesus mm. and I would say Jesus I don't know how to manage this can you please help me mm -hmm. and please lift this from me mm -hmm. you know and so and that is what happened every time I did it I was lifted out of the anxiety mm -hmm. and it's like it was like rough water becoming very calm and it was on my invitation that it would happen. And, and the level that Jesus, angels, spirits come to you, spirit guides, is the only place where they can help. So they can't help at the level of effect, right? They can't come in and put money in my bank account mm -hmm. because I my mind is what created the outcome of my bank account, my mind and my choices. Where it comes in and does the work is at the level of effect. You are cause that's affecting you affect you cause that's in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so in that whole situation was about a sick mind. My mind has become, had become very frightened, very mm -hmm. afraid. I was afraid to go out of the house. I was afraid to have a panic attack around my friends or out at a club. If I hung out with anybody, I was, I was petrified. Yeah. And then, and then I would just have them sitting in my house. And so this, you know, would enter Jesus, the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, this entity, this energy, and would immediately just put me at ease. And so over time, I healed my own anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. I didn't heal it. I healed it by inviting healing to come into me. Mm -hmm. And at this day, sometimes that I could feel that starting to happen. I immediately, it's like a, like I said earlier, a posture. I immediately know where to go. Mm -hmm. I go to the only place that can actually heal me right yeah the holy spirit it can never do you harm you have to invite it mm -hmm. yeah. i love that and guys just to reiterate what he already said um we have people of all religions or non-religions in a course of miracles you don't have to be you know religion centered around jesus or not um so i'm yeah like everyone's welcome you know but um basically this is I was so excited the other day when I thought you said Jesus was coming back. I was like, oh my God. I mean, I know it didn't like work out so well with him the first time, but I'm really excited to have lunch with Jesus. Like, let's hang out with Jesus. And then you're like, no, no, it's going to be like an energy. And like, I was like, oh yeah, like in the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there is a second coming. Uh, and the course says, basically, we've misunderstood what that means. Like the, the time Jesus came in a body is done. He's still here. He hasn't left us. Mm -hmm. And he said that, you know, as he was about ready to move on, leave the body, that he would stay and he has stayed and he's available to us. Um, and you don't have to believe in that and believe in Jesus. You don't have to, according to the course, you guys, if you've done this, it's fine. If this is what you believe in having your Lord, Jesus be your Lord and Savior. That's fine. That works for you. That It's all great. But it's not a necessity according to the course yeah. um, and that he's here to help. And he said, there have been other mystics or prophets like him that have walked the planet in the body and who are now not in a body, but are still here to help as well. Mm -hmm. And he says, it doesn't matter what name you call them. 
Now, in the course, it says it doesn't matter what name you call them by. They will come to you. They know who they are. They know what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. And he said, in the end, it's all the same one. Mm -hmm. The different forms of bodies, the different names. They give. In the end, it's all the same one. Mm -hmm. And once, you know, the enlightenment is complete and you've left the body, you're just becoming one with the Holy Spirit, the truth of you. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, you can call it Holy Spirit. You can call it a name. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's it's just that it's always there for you. All religions, by the way, are paths. The Course says, and this is what I love about the Course, it's not saying this is the only way. If you don't believe this way, you're going to perish or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. saying this is one of many paths. Mm -hmm. There are as many paths as there are individuals who need the paths. They fit you for you. And so, but it says, if it is your path, you'll know it and it would behoove you to be on that path. You don't need a hundred other paths. This is the one that will work for you. It's again, it says in the end, they're all the same path. They're for temporarily slightly different forms of the same path and whatever works for you. So in that way, all religions, all spiritual paths, spiritual practices, any one of them can get you there, mm -hmm. right? And there are ones that are perfect for different people. And so none of them is wrong. You know, teachers can be mistaken. So that path is fine, but people who teach it may make mistakes, may have a, a wrong interpretation or idea. Yeah. I'm not perfect. I never claim to be perfect. I'm certain not the end all be all in the Course of Miracles. Many people teach it, you know. Um, and so this is the thing, you know, Bruce Springsteen, anybody knows who he is, he said, don't trust the art, trust the artist. Don't trust the artist, trust the art. Mm -hmm. Don't trust the teacher. It's not about me or anybody else teaching. It's about what wants to come through. The teaching will come through even an imperfect teacher. If you are listening and wanting to receive knowledge or receive the truth, even in that imperfect teaching or even mistaken, it, you will receive it. The vehicle doesn't have to be perfect. The content, the stuff inside will be perfect if you allow it to come in. And so all religions are beautiful, right? There's no yeah. distinction. Oh my God. I just love everything you said resonates so deeply with me. And it, it's, to me, of course, miracles feels like home because whenever I would turn on for a divine message for whoever needs it, literally this stuff would come through before I found it. It, it was just amazing. It, it just rings so true to me. And what's funny is even what you just said, ah, oh, yes, like, that's exactly it. It come through. It can come through an imperfect teacher, um, and I'm not here to say anybody's imperfect. But what's interesting is the other night I was in a class and I asked a question, and what 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 I was receiving, like on the human level, the verbs, the the words, I already knew no, but it's funny because I was shown during that how to apply it anyway. What right person is saying for myself to go to the next level right oh i'm still so grateful you know what i'm saying like oh i mean i'm grateful anyway but it's so funny because one of my friends left and well, you know everybody's on their own path but i'm like no like that's exactly what your words were just just now mark i'm, I'm like yes exactly you're always going to get something out of it you know um so I, I know you have to go soon um and before we get into the power cluster program and stuff do you have time for one more experience to share that's like super magical um i, I will share what i was originally going to share but you know this okay. takes over and it happens the way it happens but okay. i so i call this the liquid light experience by the way i'm in the middle of writing a book about these miracle experiences right um and up right now the working title of the book is uh, the miraculous life right i don't know what the title actually be but i've been working on this book for a long time and stopped for a while now i'm back into it and this is one of the first stories i wrote the liquid light experience i call it but I, let's just say you know remember i said forgiveness or the willingness to see the truth is a key component to being able to to have heaven dip down and receive this knowledge be in that space which that is all knowledge right so a short, long story, I'm going to make it as short as possible. I was at an event, a weekend long event. It was one of those life transforming events. Um, and it was a beautiful experience. At the same time, my girlfriend at the time, I'm no longer with her, but at the time we were having difficulties. I won't get into all the details, but I'd given her permission to do something. And that had changed my mind about it at this event. 
And then she came home all happy that she did this thing. I told her it was okay to do it, which was no longer okay with me. <laughs> and I got very hurt, very upset. And she was, you know, innocent. Like, she was like, what the heck? You know, like, you told me not to. And so, and then I was like really mad at her. But she had to come to my graduation for this event. She came in all open hearted. And I was so angry at her, what the course would call hatred, right? Like, um, just, just like feeling hurt and angry. And every time I would look at her sitting next to me, she was like, like a deer in the headlights. She just didn't really get what was going on. And then I would look over to my teacher on the stage who I'd like fallen in love with. This guy was just so amazing, miraculous. And so I'm feeling all this love when I would turn to my right and I'm feeling all this anger and hatred. I'm turning to my left. And in that, you know, the course is you can't have love and hatred or love and fear in the same place. Hatred is really just fear. You, you can't have a shadow and light in the same place. The light always shines away the shadow. So in short order, I had this miraculous experience with her where I suddenly saw what I was doing and how everything I thought she was doing to me, I was actually doing to her. What I thought was attack on me and my reaction to it is an attack on her. I saw it clearly. And then I had nothing but remorse. And remorse is not a bad thing to have. Trust me. It drives you to change your behavior. And I, and I just turned to her in one second and I put my arms over. I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You did nothing wrong. I totally forgive you. Please forgive me. And she just started crying. She, of course, was like having whiplash at this point. And I hugged her. We're, we're at home. We live together. We're at home that night. Sleep, going to bed, go to sleep. We had a beautiful night because of that forgiveness that was bestowed upon me right? That realization, that enlightenment, that truth. And we were falling asleep. She fell asleep. I'm laying down. Next thing I know, I'm sitting up in the bed. I'm wide awake. This is not a dream. My Our bed was against the wall at the time. And I'm sitting up against the wall, straight up, wide open, looking around the room, like, how did I get here? And then I see what looks like, you know, if you have a dimmer switch on your light, looks like all of a sudden, this light started to come up in the room and it became so bright. It was a blazing, what I would call white, translucent, white, crystalline light. And what I saw was that everything is this light. Everything in the room was this light and it was so bright. It was like so intense and the only thing that distinguished anything was like this line, this outline around everything that was also the light, but it was sort of like, um, it had a like, I don't know how to describe it, almost like a neon glow to it, but it wasn't like fake light, but it had this weird neon thing that just distinguished it. It had like multiple colors in it, almost like pinkish. And that's how I could distinguish everything. But what I noticed next was light, this light was moving. It was like liquid. It was pouring. Everything was pouring into everything else. Light was pouring into these things and out from these things into everything else. And then I noticed the light was pouring. I could see through the blankets. The blankets were like this pouring light also. And I could see right to Jessica sleeping in the bed. I could see her body, which was also this liquid light. And I could see the light pouring out of her chest into mine and out from mine into hers. Oh. And I was like, wow. And in that moment, I had so much love for her. I realized she's part of me, right? Mm -hmm. She's literally feeding me light from her heart, and I'm feeding her light from my heart. And it wasn't just because we were lovers or we were in a relationship. This is happening with everyone all the time. It's happening with you and me right now, mm -hmm. right? Anybody watching this, it, it, the light doesn't know anything about distance or time or space. It's pouring all the time. And in that realization and feeling all that love, I then felt the light of heaven, literally like a, if you've ever sat under a waterfall, it felt like that. It was pouring, but not over me, into me. And I could feel the rush of this light pouring in and then pouring out of me into everything else. And I had this experience all at once of being both the light that was pouring in and the receptacle that was receiving it. And I can say that, but there's no way to really know what that experiences unless you have it and it was a beautiful it's like everything came clear to me in that moment and then i decide just by intention i'm gonna 
be the light pouring out of me. I'm going to follow that light. I'm going to. And so I went through the wall of our bedroom. We were on the second floor, which was also liquid light. I could see through it. I went through it out into the yard. It's nighttime. Everything was light. The, every blade of grass, every tree, not just what you would call natural things, but man-made things too. All the cars on the street were light. The pavement was light. And I was one with all of it. I was like pouring out into it. It was pouring out. It was the most amazing experience. It was this, you know, liquescent experience, right? It was liquid. It was light essence. And then I was like, okay, I get it. And then next thing you know, I'm sitting back in my bed, looking around at the light. And it was like somebody cued the switch and turned the light down. And now I'm wide awake, sitting in my room in the dark with like my mouth wide open. <laughs> oh my God. And I, so I wake this the woman I was with up and I to try to tell her what's going on. She goes, oh, okay, okay. Well, tell me in the morning. Like she of course couldn't get it. She thought it was just a dream. And, you know, I never really spoke of it after that with her or anybody else. Cause I realized it was at that time, it was an experience that was meant for me <sighs> and there was no way to really convey it, you know, except to tell the story. But even in telling the story, you could sort of get it right but you'll never really know what that was like unless you have the experience and i believe that's what the course of miracles um is talking about when you have revelation so in the course says you know um forgiveness the act of practicing practicing forgiveness generates miracles forgiveness is the conduit to miracles forgiveness is simply the willingness to see the truth asking to see the truth when you do that you get miracles. The truth shows up. And when you get enough of that, you become ready. There's a readiness quotient to receive a revelation, right? Mm -hmm. We all will have it. Some have it sooner than others, but everyone will have it. Mm -hmm. And when you do, it's very specific for you. It's the truth is revealed to you in a way that only you can understand. Mm -hmm. My revelation will not be the same as your revelation experience might be similar, but it's very specifically designed for each person. While we think we're separate entities, it's designed for us. And so you will have yours and it'll be just as enlightening. Think about that word enlightening as mine, right? Knowing that you are this liquid pouring light that's in everything and you're one with all of it. It is possible for you and I believe this is what's happening when musicians or great athletes seem to be in what we call the zone. Mm -hmm. They're having an awareness of the oneness. They're, they're in the place where their mind is aware that they are actually one with everything and they can move. This is all my body. And when you're in that awareness, you can move the whole body. You become the mind, oh, the umbrella mind, <laughs> and mm -hmm. you can move the whole body. So now every team is your team and they're all working on your behalf, right? So you're having this brilliant experience. It's possible for us to be in that more and more by this practice of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what happened. And, you know, I'm sure many of you out there have had your own enlightenment experience, right? Mm -hmm. Some of you may think I haven't. Sometimes we squash it down because it's a little uncomfortable to remember that all the time. But this is the thing. Once you've had it, you can't unhave it. You can't unsee what you saw, which means I can never again fully buy in to the illusion of separation. Like I'm this bag of bones and water. I'm very vulnerable. I got to go do these things to get stuff to make me okay. You know, I still participate in that dance a little bit, but I can never fully buy in because I know this thing, right? I've seen it, right? Even when I'm freaked out or think, I, that memory is always there. And some part of me is a little bit detached from the drama because I know what's really going on. And if I turn to it, any of thing that here that seems bad or wrong or not okay can be transformed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's amazing. So you don't know how you got in your bed? I know how I got into bed. I remember going to bed, okay. laying down, about to fall asleep. Just the, you know, my girlfriend at the time fell asleep first. And then- I don't know how I sat up. I didn't like get up and sit up. I next thing I'm just sitting up against the wall. Like something put me there is what it felt like. I was like, what the heck? How am I here? How is this happening? Yeah. And that's when I saw all of a sudden this, everything became this glowing, you know, translucent liquid light. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And the predominant feeling was like, would you say love or? 
it was unbelievable love, but was what I would say a sense, a deep sense of grace and safety, like, like a knowing, like, oh, this is who I, this is what it all is. This is what I am. This is what she is. This is what you are. And this is what's really happening, right? Mm -hmm. In order for this little movie that we're all living in to seem to be happening, our mind had to limit its perception or its awareness of what it actually is mm -hmm. and had to shape the light uh -huh. into what it thinks is a physical body just by belief. Uh -huh. The Course says, you, you, this isn't real, ultimately. It, it doesn't say to, dis, to deny it. You still feed it at this level. You take care of it. You do what's proper at this level. But in the ultimate truth, this is just light organized into something that seems to be solid. And the way that's done is simply by your belief. You have a body because you believe you are a body. This is why total enlightenment, once you have complete enlightenment, the Course says the, the body cannot long exist after that because the body only exists by your belief in it. When you no longer hold a belief in it, it can't be, right? Yeah. And it's saying that's not really death. That's being born again into the truth of who and what you are. But, you know, that only happens when you're ready. Like, if you think about that happening now, many people might feel afraid, like, I'm going to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to lose my body. And that's okay. It only comes when you're at that level where you know there's no real difference between here and there. It's still you. Right. It's like that. I feel bad because I feel like in today's world, if someone has this amazing experience, what if they're like, oh, oh, am I am I OK? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, OK. You know, there's that book. Anybody ever read this book? Um, it's old book. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, oh, I can't think of the name of it now, but it's about it's making a distinction um, between how our you know, modern culture deals with these types of experiences and uh, opposed to like, you know, indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. An indigenous culture, if you're 14, 15, that's often where this stuff starts to happen when you're transitioning mm -hmm. because things are happening in your body chemically that starts to open this gate, right? Mm -hmm. So some people will start to have these enlightenment experiences. And it if you're in a culture that says, wow, you're having that at a young age that means you have a gift mm -hmm. and we're going to now send you off with the shaman of our tribe and he's going to train you how to access that give, gift in a way that helps the tribe mm -hmm. right then you don't feel crazy then you feel like i'm ordained shaman mm -hmm. and then you the experience becomes a sane experience not an insane experience because what's actually happening is we're all insane Mm -hmm. illusions and though when you're having those experiences you're waking up into sanity but in a world that thinks this is sane mm -hmm. that looks insane and so when you treat people when the environment around you mm -hmm. you know the context the thing happens in makes all the difference in the world it's mm -hmm. the context that matters when the context the people the environment around you says that's crazy mm -hmm. then you will believe and your power of belief will make you feel crazy and will make you go crazy. Yep. It will become a mental illness to you rather mm -hmm. than the gift it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And so and so in this book, uh, if I can remember the name of it, it'll pop in, but it's saying we need to, you know, practice what the ancient cultures practice with these people, invite it in, train them how to manage it mm -hmm. and let it be the gift to their, you know, their people around them. They're culture their community that it's meant to be and some people are just naturally okay with it mm -hmm. like christine my friend christine o'donnell who i introduced you to and she's a definitely she doesn't call herself a psychic but she's psychically gifted that's what's happening for her but she had her moments of feeling like afraid like she's going crazy i've had my moments right um and so but you find your tribe yep. the people around you that can remind you no you're not insane Mm -hmm. You're just getting information. It's meant to help people. Just allow it to help people. You'll be fine. While it lifts them up, it lifts you up. That's the idea. Well, I wish I found you guys 18 years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. What I did find a few years later on the way to the city to a New Life Expo is in the in the manual for New Life Expo, one of the speakers, one of the talks was one-time manic episode or initiation into shamanism, just like you said. So it's so interesting, you know, 
Right. Uh, the book was called Spiritual Emergency. I don't remember the author's right. name, but it's sort of a play on words. It's an emergency, you know, if you think it's a mental Ill illness, but something's trying to emerge. Something's trying to come up. Yeah. Right. That's the yeah. idea. Yeah. That's amazing. Now tell me about your power cluster program. Okay. So real quick, this, this whole idea of inviting in, you know, spirit to guide you um, is also a way to get really clear about your passion and purpose in life, like your purpose. In the course, it says we all have a function we share and it interposes. It uses the word function and purpose the same way, a purpose or a function that we share. And our function in the world, it says it different ways, but it's to make happy or bring happiness to the world or to bring heaven to earth. That's our function, right? And we do that by joining with Holy Spirit, allowing ourselves to be guided and using our um, gifts, talents, and skills. We're all differently gifted at this level to bring forward heaven to earth, right? And so it says we all share that one purpose with a capital P, but within that, we each have our own special purpose or function, our way of delivering heaven to earth. Mm -hmm. And for each one, there is a way, and that is your way. And in this lifetime, that never changes. Your function, your purpose won't change. The form you deliver it in can change. Like I used to have climbing walls. I had 13 locations and I loved it. That was my purpose, mm. you know, to um, teach love, right? To teach love and liberate the soul. That's what I say. I have, that's my sentence for my purpose. I'm here to teach love and liberate the soul. I used to do it through these climbing walls, right? And wow. now I do it through my coaching and my teaching and through the Miracle Makers community and the power cluster. But all I'm really doing is what I came here to do, teach love and liberate the soul. First, you do it for yourself, right? That's how you get good at it. And, and so in my power clusters, we use those same processes, you know, by invitation, asking, always seek knowledge, stepping outside yourself to source to receive a vision for your purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make a distinction here between visualizing and envisioning. Not that one's good and what isn't, but they're not at the same level. Mm -hmm. To visualize is a practice. It's a good practice. It teaches you the power of your own mind and how you can cause by holding a thought in your mind, by visualizing something you want or you see. That's very powerful. And you can make a lot of things happen that way and gain a lot, you know, bring a lot on to yourself that way. Cars, houses, people, whatever. But you know, that's a good practice, but the next level up is envisioning. And it's using that thing I spoke about earlier, where you relinquish your vision or your idea about what you think is good for you or what you think will save you, the course says, mm -hmm. or what you think will make you feel good or get you what you think you need to be whole. You mm -hmm. you have to, the next level, you have to relinquish that. But that can be challenging because you think those are the things you think you want. The mm -hmm. nice car, the right guy, the right girl, the money, the job, whatever, the mm -hmm. house. Not that those things aren't okay. Not that you won't have them. It's just that they're not going to save you. They're no longer your idols. You have to relinquish those, right? Mm -hmm. And then you invite in the Holy Spirit's vision for you. What already has been there forever. It's part of the plan. And then when you do that, and I, I do that with a vision quest. We do what we call vision questing. You invite that in. You have to prepare yourself, invite it in. And you'll receive an idea, a vision for yourself. Once you've done that work, you can trust what comes. Um, and then we proceed forward. And a lot of times the vision you get may be very similar to some of what you thought you wanted, but it comes in a clarified form. Mm -hmm. It comes not just with what it is, but it also comes with how to get there. Mm -hmm. Like what you need to do, who you need to you know, be. What, mm -hmm. what you need to be like to, to encompass or to contain this vision, you're going to have to stretch. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to expand, but it shows you all of that. Mm -hmm. And over time, it's not like you get it all immediately, but you're in this process of receiving this vision or envisioning, I call that. Mm -hmm. And then in the power cluster, we use those principles and we work together and we use the principle. The course says there's nothing created without some form of union there's nothing more powerful than two or more minds joined together under one purpose. And so when you do this in a group of people, and I like to do it with eight people, eight to 10, um, each power cluster is, is its own community. 
Um, each person goes through this process individually, but shares it with their group, with their power cluster. I call them links. These are your power links. Each person's a link. And I'm sorry, someone's coming to the door. Um, and then, then you share with each other your purpose, your intention, you know, your God-given grand vision is what I call it. Your God-given grand vision. And each and every other one, my job when you share with me your God-given grand vision is to want that vision for you as much as I want my vision for myself. I want for you what you want the way I want for me. When we are in agreement with that, and I'm not in any way blocking your vision or saying, oh, who are you to have that? Or, and there's no judgment. It's like, yes, I'm saying yes to you. And, and I want you to, that is a, um, a sacred moment. Mm -hmm. That is true union occurring. We're joined together under one purpose. The course says there's nothing more powerful than that. You do that in a, in a group of eight people. Everybody in that room is holding your vision. You are now, the possibility of that vision showing up is now exponentially greater. Not just eight times greater, but eight times, eight times, eight times, eight. It's like the odds of it not showing up are very slim, right? Mm -hmm. Will it show up perfectly? No, we're all human. We get in the way sometimes. Our vision creeps back in, you know, but that's fine. We're not being asked to do it perfectly, as we described earlier. We're just, it will still do what it's meant to do, but it, the odds of it showing up are much greater. So in this process, and there are many processes I take them through in the group, it creates this bond with your group. Like many of my vision teams, many of the peace circles I used to do at Marianne, and there's similar principles at work as with the peace circles. <laughs> are still together to this day. I started doing the peace circles in like 2001. And mm -hmm. so these people will still call me and tell me what's going on in their life now, right? So it's a bond if you want it to be. It could be your lifelong, you know, um, your power link cluster. So anyway, the idea is that you, the goal is to launch mm -hmm. your God-given grand vision in six months. That's the goal. Many people do it. Some people take seven months or eight months. But I can show you person after person after person who's still in touch with me that have gone way exceeded, right? What showed up for them in their vision. Their lives have expanded in great ways because of this. And, you know, some of the people that are best at this are the, the very young people that came because they don't, their minds aren't cluttered so much, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got a couple of young guys that came into my, some of these power clusters at, at 20 years old, right? 19, 20 years old. Perfect. These guys, uh, you know, four, three, four, five years later are, it's amazing what they've become and what they're doing in their lives. And I just, you know, again, my purpose is to teach love and liberate the soul. But at this level, I like to say, I like my, what I love to do in my coaching is help other people find their purpose and manifest it. It is so deeply fulfilling to me to do that. And that's what the power cluster program does. I will also do one-on-one -on -one coaching and stuff like that. Part of the power cluster program, there is some one-on-one -on -one coaching, but man, it's a vehicle. It's like an incubator for your vision. It's very powerful. Oh my God. That is amazing. And uh, it's so funny because I feel like all of us metaphysical leaders had like the same vision. Like when I was 23, that's kind of like what I was doing, but you made a whole business out of it because you're amazing. Um, but also I was writing a book once and I was getting like information and I asked why we were here and pretty much what you said five minutes ago was it it was like oh so that like heaven comes here like so you can like physicality and heaven merge and and I literally I was just looking I don't know where it is I know you have to go but I had business cards for the book that said creating heaven so it, it's it's amazing you said it much better and I'm glad I didn't act on it because you're doing a much better job. Um, oh, no. Well, look, we're in the same vein. That's why we're here doing this. You you attract your tribe, right? You attract like energy. So that's how it is. And that's a good news and the bad news, right? So whoever's around you is vibrating to some aspect of you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. This is, and, and this is beautiful, like what we get to create together. It's beautiful. It, yeah. yeah, it really is amazing. So where can people find you? Um, so you can go to... Um, um, markvandergag.com markvandergag.com m-a-r-k-v-a-n-d-e-r-g-a-a-g.com and you can access me through there you can also email me at mark at markvandergag.com i'll connect you I've, we have many 
uh, landing pages, many ways to understand what's happening. But at markvandergag.com, if you want to find out about the Power Cluster, click on that button, the Power Cluster button. It'll take you to a landing page. There's like 10 uh, videos of people from past Power Clusters, you know, giving testimonials. There are going to be some new ones coming up with these guys four or five years later, um, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, once you make those connections with me, reach out to me through the email. I'm happy to set up a phone call with you and do a discovery coaching session, which is free. It's an hour session. Just that session itself can have a very great impact um, to help you get clear about some things, see if it would be a fit for us to work together. If it is, you'll know it and I'll know it. Um, you know, we'll discuss it more. Amazing. Okay, Mark, thank you so much. You, Your voice resonates so deeply with me. So do your words and your vibe and your spirit. Um, I know it's going to resonate with my audience uh, because, I mean, I don't know who you wouldn't resonate with. Um, and uh, I want to let you go because you have exciting plans to do today. And I'm sure you'll be getting a lot of emails from this. So uh, so I'm really glad you came. I'm so honored. Oh, thank um, you so much. Yeah, I'm honored to be here. I just want to say one last thing about the Miracle Makers community. And uh, if you want to learn more about the Course of Miracles, or if you're already a Course of Miracles student, you want to join um, with Christina and I and a really awesome group of people who come every Wednesday evening, 7.30 to 9, and every Friday morning, 10 to 11.30 a.m. Um, we're on Zoom. Uh, you know, feel free to jump in and join us. I'm happy to have you. Yeah. yeah. You can find that information again by emailing me or going to the website. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Right. Thank Let you. Me. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank All you right. So I much. love you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you guys for being here, and I'll see you next time.